Welcome to a conversation about the terrific and compelling short Laylac. I'm here with its director, producer, writer, producer, one of the stars and executive producer. And I guess I'll start off by asking Scott, director. I think one of the most incredible things about it is you basically end with two minutes of no dialogue. I mean, that's a really huge thing to do. And what you're saying there is you build enough trust in your actors and for us as an audience that you can do something like that. Talk about that moment. To me, that was really compelling and it really gave me some idea of your confidence and command as a director. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, when, when you're creating a film with such emotion and, and, and such magnitude, you, you must trust your audience. You have to trust in your actors and the story that you're actually going to be telling. So at the end of the day, what we wanted to do was let our actors just delve in the moment and be themselves. One of the biggest things that I love doing with my actors is letting them not necessarily go off the script, but be who they are. We work so hard in rehearsals and acting and all this other stuff. I say, you know, be you, be who you've become. You know that character better than anybody else. So no reason to speak it. Because when you have the mask, that was a whole new thing now with you know COVID, we have these masks. You know, the eyes are now our communicators. Sometimes we can't hear people when we have the mask on. Sometimes we can't see if they're smiling or angry when they're waiting in line for at a, at a food store or something. So I think what one of the biggest things when masks were new to me was that I realized the eyes are the most important communicator we could possibly have. So why not have that? be put on film, put that visually, let the audience see what we all been seeing for the last year and a half. So at the end of the day, I think what I wanted to end up doing was let the audience learn more by just watching rather than hearing what needed to be felt. Because at the end of the day, it's all about emotion, not necessarily the dialogue. So that's something that I really wanted to accomplish that I knew that the actors were able to accomplish and let our audience also be able to enjoy that moment even more. Mustafa, I can ask you, because I think it's really interesting that this film starts in a cemetery and it's sort of about this, this push and pull between characters who can't deal with the present and, and can't deal with the past. You know, mm. information is being kept away from rank. And, and, and our lead really, by seeing him in that cemetery, we're seeing he, we're seeing his connection to his past and he can't see the future. I want you to talk about that because it really seems to me about as much as anything about time. Absolutely. I think um, the story starts in a period in this um, grave digger's life where <clears throat> we catch him on his most vulnerable moment in his life. He feels guilty and he cannot share with anybody and he has to continue. He has to continue working. He has to continue uh, being the, the head of the house because he has a daughter at the end. I think there's so much that he hides and the movie is pretty much all about that too. His journey of trying to face the reality that he went through and also to share that, maybe you know, share his pain with his daughter so that he can actually continue together with her as a family smaller but still maybe even bigger now because two people left in their life if i can get you both to talk about this i think it's interesting it starts off again in the cemetery and these guys are wearing green work clothes so for a moment we don't know if they're workers or if they're working in, in, in some military site i mean there's so much going on that it really sort of demands the audience pay a lot of attention and I want you guys to talk about that construction because it's almost kind of a mystery. We're wondering, well, what are we watching here? Yeah, I think that's one of the most you know, alluring things about movies is how do you start a movie off to capture an audience in? And I think by showing and not saying anything, just letting the characters feel like a documentary, that was the biggest thing we wanted to do. We wanted the film to feel like a documentary, that we were just following these characters watching their every move and just trying to learn from them, not necessarily what they were saying, but what they were doing, how they were reacting. So to open up in a thing that could have been like a war zone, I think was the biggest, most compelling way to open up the film because you don't know when, where, why, or how. All you know is that something devastating happened. And when you lift the camera up, you start introducing the characters, you start learning more and more about where we are. 
I think that's where we start, you know, learning more about who we are actually caring about and who journey we want to be on. And I think that was one of the things that we were discussing for God knows how long, how do we open up this film? How do we start it off right? And the only way we could start it off right is where our lead was sometimes most at home. That's where he made his living. That's how he kept his family alive and fed by working at this job. But now it's such a dichotomy during this time that he had to experience the emotional and physical toll that was being placed upon him. You know, Stuff, I wanted to get you in there too because I can't think of any sort of better way to start a short about emotional upheaval during a pandemic than in a place like this, but also not letting us know what's going on. I mean, it could be the past, it could be the future. He's gonna, again, these guys are in green work clothes. Um, we, don't, we don't have a whole lot of knowledge. And, and that, to me, it feels like you're trying to sort of create, you guys create a metaphor for what we're going through now. I think so, Elvis. I think that, let me, let me add this as well. I think that there's something about everyone so doing their best to try to move forward right now and how we will have collective amnesia. We want to go on and go to the movies and do all these normal things, but everyone can do that. And we actually can't, we've all changed. We've all experienced something. And I think the lens that these filmmakers have taken is to drop us into the center of that every man or every woman and really just say, hey, these are still the casualties of what we're living with. They're right next to us. They're across the street. They're on the bus. They're your neighbor. Someone is still going through this. We're still actually in the pandemic. We're not out of it. So I think, especially in a short form, it's that little piece that we can give to audiences to remind us about our humanity and who we are right now. We don't, we're not giving you a lot to, we're giving you a lot to digest in a small amount of time. And I think that those are the things that we need right now to remember, this is where we are right now. We're not done. We're still doing the work. We're still in it together. And especially the, especially as much as we have, you know, the, the applause has died down for the frontline workers, you know, but it, it's almost saying we need to continue that applause because we're still, they're still there. And still on the front line. And I guess since you, I'm glad you waited on this call because it also feels to me too, like it's, it's much about this kind of collateral damage of people who are foreign born in this, in this country, who still don't really get to connect in ways that we'd like to connect with them. It feels like that that's a big missing piece in this thing too. You know, just, just people who are not born in this country, but have traditions and that we tend to look away from. I agree. I think that, that that's, would you want to speak to that Mustafa? Absolutely. I think that's very, very well said. Most of the times we kind of, you know, don't even notice these people. Are they even existing? You know, we live with them. I mean, they do everything for us. And pretty much all we do is just, you know, very much focused on our life and not even noticing that so much things are done because of these people. I mean, this is the least we can do for them, trying to, you know, tell their stories and tell them that we share your pain. We understand. We know you exist. We recognize it. Mm. Isabel, if I may ask you, because you've been very patient. So if I can ask you, what's your first conversation with, with Scott and Mustafa was about, about playing this character and what you thought of her as you were learning about her? Well, when we were, when the first time that we came together, it was really, who is this character? Where does she start? And where does she end up throughout the film? Um, and to us, the scene that with her that stood out the most was actually one that we ended up adding after most of the, um, the scenes were done, which is where she finds out that her mom is not okay, where her dad tells her that her mom is unfortunately passed away. Because in that scene, we saw that all the collective emotion from the film that built up in her, which started out with, why doesn't dad take me to the hospital? And at the end is the realization of everything that's falling apart around her. And all that collective emotion we thought when it came through was where in a sense, the character hides her emotion through the film a lot. And in that scene where she finds out, it starts to come through. Mm. Yeah, I, I think so. And that takes us back to where we started. Because again, that's the big scene where we learn or we get this thing played out for us in real time and nobody's talking. I mean, some of these movies, 
would have us here, there'd be screaming and all this accusation. And we feel the weight of this entire world pass before us in about two minutes. And again, mm. taking us through the end of the film, when there's nobody talking. I found myself just sort of, it was like being in a suspense movie, you know, because what's going to break this? And in fact, as you were saying, Coleman, this doesn't get broken. There is no breakthrough. We still have to get, go through each day, a day at a time. And that to me is why I said, to me, it feels like the movie's about time because nothing's going away mm. anytime soon. And, and uh, I, I don't want to harp on this, but since it's, Isabella's brought it up so beautifully, taking us to that moment when nobody's talking, was that always in the script? Or, or how did that happen? Absolutely. <clears throat> what happened is, um, just like, you know, Coleman mentioned that it's so packed. There is, we are trying to tell a story that we all live, literally we all go through, and but just we run out of words. I, as a writer, after I wrote a few pages of it, I didn't want to write anything. It's just like I was literally just flowing with the emotions of it. I don't need it to write anything because sometimes when you put things into words, you lose it. It kind of takes it away from it. So it was a pure light, pure spiritual moment that literally if we can continue that way, I would probably write another 30 pages just without the dialogue because it was flowing so well. Everybody was so connected to it. And I, as a writer, I was too. I was like, I don't need to write any dialogues. They're there. They, they went through, we went through all this. We don't need to tell them. Uh, Scott, I, can we, go ahead, Isabel, what were you gonna say, I'm sorry. Okay, so basically I thought that the physicality and the physical actions in that last scene moved the story forward <laughs> much better than it could have done with dialogue or with additional words. So I absolutely agree with what you said. Mm. Come, if you can tell me how you, this, this came to you, how you ended up finding out about these guys and this project. Well, the beautiful thing is I, I'm, I started a production company about a year and a half ago, and I've been not only drawn to certain, you know, small stories that are, you know, about ordinary people that are amplified in different ways, whether it's animation, film, television. And I, these gentlemen have, they came to me and they, I guess we, it's a lovely marriage. They, they saw that this is something I wanted to be a part of and help amplify, at least they hoped, I guess, and they sent it to me. Right. And, I th and I really did, I, I watched it <clears throat> immediately and then I had to watch it again to make sure I saw what I saw, which was something so moving and something that I felt was so absolutely necessary today, especially in the, the space of film. I thought it was, it was a knockout immediately. And I thought, how can I make sure that I can get this into as many hands and eyes as possible? Because it does all the things that I think Elvis does the best things that we want with the short film. You know, that great impact, that great character, story, something that's going to move you to change. Truly, I think, something that's going to open your eyes up to another world, to another way of being, and connect us uh, deeper. And I think maybe that's what I'm looking for. And so I think that that's the, the marriage that we have um, come, on, come on with, and also with Doug as well. Doug, Doug I've, I've known him for a, a good year now. And so it just makes sense. We're all like, it's all, you know, especially with the short film, it's all hearts and minds together. And I just want to help continue what they already started, which was to tell a great, compelling story about ordinary human beings being extraordinary, you know? No, I mean, it, it's so interesting because it's, you can't help but think, wow, this is a movie at the very beginning about the literal dirty business of burying a body. I mean, it's mm. the, the movie's so like basically gets its hands on things in a really interesting way without saying it. Because so often in shorts, as you know, you see them we hear people declaiming or saying what they're gonna do. And in fact, nobody ever really says that the mom's dead. I mean, all these things, it's just the way people communicate and, and the people talk in half sentences or nods or, or allusions to things. And, and to me, that's a lot of the power of this is that there's so much in it that's unsaid in conventional ways. Yeah. I also love that, I have to add that I love the fact that the language was really um, phenomenal for me. I love the fact that I get to lean in and be taken away to Queens to some, with the, these, these uh, father and daughter, and I need to lean in and figure out where they're going, what are they doing, what's this relationship. Um, again, I get to lean into another world. No one's you know, saying, making it easy for me. But it was very simple because 
you know so much with gesture, with, um, <laughs> you know, with uh, the way they look at each other, the way they don't look at each other. It's beautiful. But it's this thing that, I mean, you, and it's an incredible thing. I want you guys, Scott, you and Mustafa to talk about this, to start, to make a film about a grave digger and we have to think about what this guy's gone through over the past year and a half. I mean, just seeing somebody at a grave site with shovels crew, I mean, you just sort of think you're talking about, as you were saying, Coleman, the, the frontline people who maybe we don't acknowledge as much as we did a year and a half ago, but certain people we just don't ever think about because we don't want to think about what it must be like for a grave digger. And I want you guys to talk about coming up with that setting and that character and what that does, knowing what that does to audiences immediately. Sure. Um, well, so the story, uh, it's kind of makes me think that where this all started. Um, well, this story came to me in a, in a, a poem, form of a poem. And, but from uh, articles that Scott was sharing when we were uh, in the height of the pandemic. So I was reading, looking at the articles that he was sharing, but I was also trying to understand what was happening. You know, is the end of the world coming? Do I need to really try to, you know, do something else in my life or just wait for, to find out what's gonna happen tomorrow? You know, as I'm trying to deal as a, a personally, I was also trying to do like, maybe it's just a sign. We, maybe we can turn this, you know, terrible times into something productive and really as a storyteller witness what's happening and kind of, uh, you know, interpret, uh, put our own expression to the world. When Scott sent us, sent me the article, in one of the article, there was a, a grave digger holding a pickaxe in front of this empty uh, tons of uh, graveyard. And he looked very dark hopeless, desperate. I'm like, I think I'm connected to this person. I'm really seeing that he's looking at it. I'm looking at it, the empty graves with him. I'm like, who did he lose? Or does it even matter at this point? Everybody is dying. Everybody's mothers and children and families are dying. What, what, what it matters at the end is I'm like, I don't know how to react to this, but something is hitting me here. So I sat down and said, I think Scott, I think I need a few days to understand what's happening. That started to, you know, turn this into hope. I hope that I turned this into something that is meaningful, also something that is universal. Because COVID, we went through, we know it, we don't need to talk about it. But it's a very universal story, too, about a father and daughter. They're losing, they're losing their, you know, he's losing his wife, um, she's losing her mother. What worse can happen? And this is the worst happened to them. And the one thing is about a uh, graveyard is I really, really insisted that. And Scott and Dennis were fantastic. I said, we have to have dirt. You know, earth, you touch to it. When I see, I lost my dad when I was nine. The only time that I felt that he was okay is when I saw him being buried and then closed with the dirt on it. I said, okay, he's safe there. I know that he's there. So whenever I can go, he's gonna be there. Last time when I saw him, I think it was that we saw. We at some point we said, should we make him a employee, um, employee working for an ice truck, putting the bodies? That kind of to me it felt really weird. I said I would hate myself as a writer seeing you know like seeing someone pulling bodies and putting into ice truck. I would never want mm. loved one to be to be into the ice truck. That feels that doesn't feel right, but it's almost like it's okay. There's like, this is the last station. You put your loved one into the grave, pray to it, send it away. There was something very sad, but also very spiritual and kind of comfortable. Too. Gosh, I, I can't watch the movie and not think, as I'm sure you had the same reaction too, Coleman, of the cultures where life is at much more risk before COVID, where, you know, People weren't didn't feel safe, and 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 being in the United States, a place where you come presumably to be safe from the kinds of things that can happen anywhere else, and you're not safe here. I mean that that idea of you know feeling secure has really kind of gone away. And see, there's just so much going on in this thing subtextually. I could talk about it for hours, mm -hmm. and and I just really felt like we. It's a reminder, for me, that we have to rethink 
ourselves as uh, think about the way we approach the world as Americans, but also the way we look at other cultures. I mean, the movie felt like it was about that to me too. I agree. I, I agree. Of course. I, I mean, I mean, just and going off of that, I mean, I've been a New Yorker my whole entire life. I was born and raised here. And one of the things about being a New Yorker, it's, it's, it's a melting pot, you know, especially in Queens and living so close to it. I've seen cultures from all around the world, you know, come here to, to find acceptance, to find safety. And, you know, I have friends from all over the world. And now I have tons of Turkish friends as well, which is such a beautiful thing. You know, filmmaking brings everybody from all around the world together. And that was one of the beautiful things about this film, that I had the opportunity to do that. I haven't had that before, but because of the pandemic, because of what was going on, I realized, you know, as, as much as there was such negativity going around the world, there was this sense of coming togetherness that could make us stronger. And I think with the, you know, negativity throughout the entire film per se, but this, this, this turmoil, this, this, this guilt, you know, at the end of the film, we come off as an audience saying that sticking together is the way to go about life. We have to, you know, through, through turmoil, through the toughest of times, having someone lean their head on your shoulder can make everything okay. The simple touch that we've missed because we couldn't see family members, we couldn't go to hospitals where loved ones were dying, a simple touch is so much more special and so much more appreciated now. And I think human interaction has been elevated when we are with humans, when we are together. And I think that's what I needed to experience in my life, where we're bringing the whole world together mm -hmm. on a film set to, to the whole world. I mean, we're showing this film everywhere and people are reaching out to us from all around the world. And I keep saying the world because we're all experiencing this. And as Coleman said, as Elvis, as you said, as everyone says, we're still going through it together. And we'll get out of this mm. together. And I think that's how we wanted our audiences to leap off with. Mm. Well, if I can ask you, what was the first, the, the first scene you shot? And how did you prepare for it? Because it's such a, I mean, I'm glad you can smile just seeing him looking at you because that's you do <laughs> really a demanding role. So what was the first thing you shot? And if you remember how you prepared for it? I think the very first scene that we shot was the one with the taxi. Was that it? Mm, wow. Yeah, and to prepare for that, we I remember we all came together into my house and I specifically remember the feeling I had in such a secluded and lonely time, how both in and out of the film, we were able to come together as a family. And that feeling provided all the glue and all the material I needed to play my character. It gave me the emotion that I needed in that kind of a time. And, and also, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I just want, you know, Isabella is just an incredible actress and, you know, you know, for such a young woman, you know, to, to be able to exude such emotion and real emotion, that was the testament to the work that we had to do prior you know, it was, you know, coming together as a family at Isabella's house, her parents and family were so willing for us to come over and rehearse and talk about that when we came on set, a lot of the times, because there is no dialogue, we just said, be, just be. And sometimes we just nail it in the take and we move on because it's the most realistic thing that we had to go approach. And it's the most realistic approach. It's just, it's just by being, not worrying about what you have to say or what you should have said or what you should have done but just living in your own environment. And by throwing, you know, Isabella into the first scene, the taxi scene where it's all anxious anxiety, it's her first day on set as it is her first film that she's acted in. What a beautiful opportunity to get that real emotion out of it, to throw in this most intense anxiety in Queen's scene. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I'm sorry to jump in. I just, I'm just so proud of what you've accomplished here that I just wanted to throw that information out there. Isabella, you're awesome. You really are. Thank you so yeah. much. I, really, I, I want to, go for it. Go for it, Isabella. Thank you. All of you guys, and also especially with um, Nadir, helped me feel so comfortable on set each and every day, especially for my first ever production. So thank you big time for that. 
I, I want to piggyback on something because I think this is it'll tie in a lot of things that you guys were saying. Um, Isabella, one of my favorite moments, actually, and I had to think about why it was one of my favorite moments. And it's not a deeply emotional moment. It's not something, you know, calling on our better angels. It's actually the moment where you pulled your mask down and smelled the lilacs. And I think in that moment, as I process that, I think that's the moment where I feel like this is about me. And I think everyone in the audience will feel the same way because you're like, I want to, not only for myself, but for that little girl, I want to smell the flowers again. I know that by having the mask on, I know what we're in. I know the world that we're in, the devastating world, because it's such a symbol now. But that moment that young girl just took that down with all that delight in her eyes and just smelled the flowers. I was like, I want to get back there. I want to smell the flowers with her, for her. That's what it was about. I think that's the way it sort of like wrapped me as an audience member, you know, because it's just that simple thing. So thank you for that. No, I mean, and that's such a great point to bring up too, Colin, because it's everybody looking for that moment of hope, you know, mm. and, 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 you know, we don't see it with our, I mean, with our lead. Finally, he gets it when his daughter rests her head on his shoulder. We sort of feel like he's got that same, what you're talking about, the way she experienced those flowers. He finally has this moment where he feels like her father and he feels like he's in the world in a way he hadn't been. He doesn't have a wife and this girl doesn't have a mother. But that moment they have each other and hmm. that, I was just talking about as we started about time and not being able to get away from the past. We feel that moment for him, he's got a future. And, and, and there are these moments, I think there are a few like that, that are about trying to find a way to look ahead when this, the sister says, when are you going to tell her? I mean, that too is about trying to say, clear a path and start. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and to me, again, you were talking about, getting so much about the script. And again, guys, as, as director and writer, there's just so much information in this. And it just, as a last question I'll ask, how long did it take to whittle it down into this really intense and pure form? It's, it's been reduced into its essence. How long did it take to get it there? Um, I guess script wise, it's, it, it was a quick process. I came up with the first draft in a few hours, but to, sit down and do rewrites where we opened up the room and kind of trying to understand everybody's feelings all the time and what see what they think it turned into an amazing collaboration i think the overall it took close to two months to get where we were at uh, but then as we started to improvise it on set two sometimes things felt again although we tried to you know use the language very economically didn't want to tell much and just go with the flow and the feeling of it. Uh, I thought we were there, but even on set, when they were acting, it was such a fragile uh, scene that we were working on. So we, we, we improvised it there too. So it kind of, it's kind of, it fluttered itself, kind of went, you know, down to yeah. where it is now. And, and just going off what Mustafa said, you know, it's shocking that someone could write such a powerful thing in a few hours, but I think it's because he wrote it in a few hours that it, it found its most authentic form that you weren't thinking, he wasn't thinking, he wasn't saying, oh, what would they do? What would they say? It's just, this is what they, this is, this do, just do. And I think that's a beauty that allowed myself as a director to work off of, to read it the first draft, to see where, we needed to bring this to, to feel the essence, to feel the, the quietness, the, those moments rather than the overall picture because the moments will lead up to that last and final shot. And talking about the improvisation, which I absolutely love as a director, one of my favorite scenes in the film is when Yusuf Nadir goes up to, you know, where the, where the chest is with the mirror and he goes and grabs the masks of his wife and basically what we did as our production designer, Anna Driftmeyer, who's incredible and a brilliant, brilliant production designer, she went over and created this beautiful, you know, chest where all the white stuff was all scattered around, an unfinished mask, a homemade mask to show like 
you know, they don't have a lot of money. They can't go out and buy stuff, but all these little moments were there. And we told um, Nadir to, hey, this is your playground. Go ahead and, and do as you may. And then he grabbed the mask. That was not scripted. That was not directed. That was not anything. That was the moment where we realized as a team that we achieved something where they became these characters. And that's the confidence that we allowed them to have, to allow our audience to have, to allow the world to have. And, you know, that was that moment when he puts that mask to his face. We're like, that's that it's once again, no words, just the moment. And the moment speaks so much louder than words. It does. I'm going to take this time now to thank you, Scott, Mustafa, Isabella, Coleman. Thank you guys so much. And thanks for making such a terrific film. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you, you, Elvis. Yeah.